Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's Superman in the Bronze Age. Your geek history lesson on Superman in the Bronze Age is now in session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason, sometimes Bronze Inman. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. Welcome to your mind university because you have stumbled onto the podcast where we take one character, construct, or piece of publishing history from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about them in about an hour. And this is part of a twofold iconic series in that with some of the very big DC Comics characters who've been around for almost a, a century now, it's going to say a millennium, uh, we are breaking them up by publishing era. So this is the ongoing uh, Superman series, and this is also our first character to enter the Bronze Age. Yes, and we'll, we'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, we are talking about Superman today because Superman is hitting the small screen, uh, with Superman and Lois on the CW, and that is why we are doing another installment of Superman's history, because like Ashley said, it is so big, you cannot fit this into one episode. And there's so many stories that you don't want to gloss over and so many things. So to explain what we mean by Superman, the Bronze Age, let me explain the ages to you. Now, none of these are super official, it's what a bunch of comic nerds like myself and like you have decided. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of arguments on either way about the years or whatever. This is just what we've decided to do. You know, it's our podcast. Exactly. Just go with it. All right. The Golden Age is from 1938 to 1956. Most people agree that it begins with Action Comics number one and it ends with the first appearance of Barry Allen in Showcase number four, October 1956. The Silver Age, of course, begins with that appearance of Barry Allen as the new Flash, and it goes until 1970. Basically, the Silver Age was restricted storytelling with often silly stories, but we start to get hints of more depth. Uh, you know, basically, Barry Allen, also some people say the start of the Silver Age is the introduction of the Comics Code Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, you, would you want to explain what that is, just in case anybody doesn't know? The Comics Code Authority was uh, kind of like the... There's a motion picture version of it. Can't think of what it stands for. Um, the MPAA. Thank you. I don't know what the acronym stands for. Motion picture something something. I think it's the Arts Association. Association. Uh, where basically a governing body decided that comics were too gay because of Batman and Robin. And so they set down a bunch of rules to make it uh, less gay, less offensive, more family friendly. And what was interesting about this is the restriction forced a lot of creativity into the medium. They don't exist anymore. Yes. Now, this the next age is the Bronze Age, which is from 1970 to uh, 1985, and that is the one we're covering today. The precipitating event is, many things, is Jack Kirby leaving Marvel for mm -hmm. DC or Gwen Stacy killed in Spider-Man 121. Mm, Could be either. Interesting. The next age after that, so when we go to the next Superman, it'll be Superman, the Dark Age. The next one is the Dark Age, and it's from 1985 to the year 2000. Comics get darker, they get grittier, they get morally ambiguous, and sometimes they stray into terrible, bad juvenileism while pretending to be mature comics. Many people think that that starts with either Christ of Infinite Earths, The Dark Knight Returns, slash Watchmen, depending on what you want yeah, to go for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the modern age is from 2000 to now, and it's basically also being called the Electrum Age or the Digital Age, depending on the rise of digital comics. It's called the Reboot Age. But basically they're saying that it starts at 2000 because that is post the Marvel bankruptcy, mm. also post the effects of the popping of the speculator bubble. But yep. most people attribute the beginning of the modern age in 2000 because there's a little old movie called X-Men, mm -hmm. the popularity of superhero movies affecting comic books. Oh, so, interesting. Yes. So that are... Those are all the ages. We are talking about the Bronze Age today, 1970 to 1985. Cool little uh, 15 years there. Now, just to let you know, we have covered Superman twice. Episode 108 is Superman the Golden Age. Mm -hmm. Episode 207 is Superman in the Silver Age. And so it's been a while. So about every 100 episodes, we get to a Superman one, and we are behind on Batman and Wonder Woman. We are behind on Batman. <laughs> These episodes take quite the a bit. The most. They take a lot of time. So, yeah. 
that's the reason why. But now it's time for us to drop into Superman the Bronze Age. Before we get to that, if you need more geek history lesson content, if you think that this conversation, this episode, is not enough Superman conversation, then head on over to patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, and get yourself three more exclusive geek history lesson type podcasts over there for your your, your loving your listening pleasure geek history lesson extra is where we talk more about the subject there's jason and ashley's excellent adventures where we get personal about our lives and also there is a justice league podcast that's in the pike very soon or if you're listening to this in the far far future it's already out and you're loving it you're loving yeah. it so head over to patreon.com slash john and become a super friend and thanks to all the patrons that help keep this podcast going thank you now before we get to the Bronze Age, Ashley, we have to talk about the Silver Age. We've got to mm. give you a little recap. In the Silver Age, Superman got his super pets. Yep. Name one of them. Streaky. Who's Streaky? She's Supergirl's cat. Yeah. <laughs> Name Superman's dog. Crypto. We're going to talk about him more. We learned about, in the Silver Age, we learned about all the different forms of kryptonite. Oh, Sup- yeah. Superman became red and blue for the very first time. Mm-hmm. But now it's time for change. This is a time for Superman to become a little bit more like the modern Superman that we know. Interesting. Now let's talk about some publication history for the Bronze Age. Mort Weisinger was the editor on Superman comic books from 1941 to 1970. Mort Weisinger was the editor throughout most of the Golden Age and most of the Silver Age. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure that Superman was always kind of wacky because that way Superman would be considered kid friendly mort weisinger retired in 1970 and julia schwartz took over now in a later interview mort weisinger admitted that he had grown out of touch with newer readers julia schwartz basically wanted to take away all the additional elements of the superman mythos saying that this was watering down Superman. So he didn't want the super pets. He didn't want all the alternate Kryptonians. He didn't want all the wackies. He just wanted to tell stories about Superman. And somewhere, the cells that would become little Jason said, yes, yes, do any Kryptonians, yes. Now, Mr. Schwartz's first act was to get writers like Denny O'Neill, mm-hmm. Elliot S. Magan, one of the most important Superman writers of all time, and Carrie Bates to tone down the weirdness and to bring in new stories and themes. They wanted to remove overused plot elements such as kryptonite, robot doppelgangers, and eventually they would change Clark Kent's job. We will get to that. Okay. Uh, Schwartz also scaled down Superman's powers closer to the level that was intended by Siegel and Schuster, the original Superman creators, because they did not want a Superman that could punch a planet out of orbit. Mm -hmm. So, the Bronze Age of Superman, we're going to talk about the fictional publication history now, or excuse me, the fictional history of the character. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all started with the buyout of the Daily Planet. What? Yes. Now, Galaxy Broadcasting System did a corporate buyout of the Daily Planet immediately in the Bronze Age, reshuffling the traditional roles of the planets, uh, reshuffling all the planets' traditional roles by their new owner, a man called Morgan Edge. Mm. Now, Morgan Edge is the president of the GBS, the Globe Galaxy Broadcasting System, of course, and he's secretly the leader of Intergang. And he became the president uh, and the controlling factor of the Daily Planet by buying a lot of Daily Planet stock. Now, Ashley... Can you explain what Intergang is? And do, you, and do you know the big secret of Intergang? Um, Intergang is like ki- an alien crime syndicate? Not, you're not cool. You're kind of there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I got. Uh, and I'm going to say that their secret is that they uh, worship all of Superman's super pets and they're really upset uh, at the editor for benching them. <laughs> Intergang is something that I have uh, heard reference, and I know I've <laughs> spoken about in lessons before. I've, I don't think I've ever read a story with Intergang. In Intergang it. is basically like think about the mob in Metropolis, except they're sort of futuristic because mm-hmm. they use all types of alien weapons. They are humans. Okay, so I wasn't completely wrong. They are based in Metropolis, but mm-hmm. they are being funded by aliens. And the that's big, right. Yeah. The big secret is is that they're being funded by Darkseid. Mm-hmm. Yes, Darkseid is secretly using them to. Mess with Superman. Yes, because they do. They are. They're involved in all the fourth world stuff. Yes, 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 yes. 
Um, I'm gonna count. I'm gonna give myself half a point for that. Like I said, you were close. <laughs> I just had I just had the words in the you wrong order. You were almost there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So there we go. Okay. But before we get to that and all the intricateness and Clark Kent's new job, pretty sure I know what his new job. You probably know. We have talked about it before. Yeah. There's a change to Kryptonite. Okay. In a story called Kryptonite Nevermore. Is it the pink Kryptonite that makes you gay? No. Actually, That's a fun one. Besides your thoughts on pink kryptonite, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I want to ask you. I don't know if we talked about this on any of the podcasts, and in 300 episodes, it's getting hard to remember. Uh huh. We're closing out on 350. Um, wait, this might be episode 350. I, I have no think idea. This is three. We're recording this ahead of time. Who knows what the number is? Yeah. Anyways, time back to kryptonite, the mm-hmm. more important number or element. Ashley, mm. I don't know your thoughts on kryptonite. What do you feel about kryptonite? Goofy, silly? Do you like it? Is it a necessary part of Superman? I'm giving you a lot of elements. I, I honestly don't know what you think about kryptonite. I Are you concerned that it's in our modern world no. and it could ruin our lives? That keeps me up at night. Does it? Of course. I know you own a chunk of it. I do. You own several chunks of kryptonite. You own a plastic one and a soap one. I do. And- That's why it keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, I think for a contemporary audience yes i think we're past it so you would get rid of kryptonite altogether i would yep. um because every time it shows up my eyes roll right out of my skull uh including in bvs mm-hmm. i was like friggin really wait, 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 what's, B- what's this bvs okay. oh, batman versus superman thank you colon, colon dawn of justice thank you um which is a movie that i enjoy sure I um, enjoy and, and i think it is silly i think it is a mark of when it was created yes um, of all the Superman things that are silly, it's probably the one that I like the least. Like, I don't have issues with the glasses as the identity hider. Mm-hmm. The way I have, I just think kryptonite is dumb. Okay. Um, that's a fair, that's a fair viewpoint. But also I do understand that when you work with a character with this type of legacy, you do your best with the traditions and it is a part of Superman's tradition. But yes. yeah, I think it's silly. How about you? I like it. But like the Joker, I think it's overused. Uh, correct. And that is why I'm particularly a, by Lex. Yep. And that is why I'm a big fan of this Kryptonite Nevermore storyline by Denny O'Neill. All right, tell me about it. So here's the storyline of Kryptonite Nevermore. And you know the storyline of Kryptonite Nevermore. And I would say most of our listeners know this story because the cover is Superman wrapped in green chains. Oh, I love that and cover. He's breaking them with this yeah, chest. Yeah. They made a statue out of it. They made several statues they made out of it. They made posters of it. It's it's a very famous and iconic image. And actually I would share it. On I the, will. the GHL socials uh, so everyone gets to see it. It's a very, very famous cover for Kryptonite Nevermore. Now, in Kryptonite Nevermore, Superman helps out with an experiment involving green kryptonite as a new and alternative power source. Ooh. Of course, because this is comics, the experiment goes haywire and the energy harnessing machine explodes. Now, Superman tries to stop this tries to contain the explosion, but he fails and is knocked out by the full blast of the explosion that is filled with green kryptonite. But strangely, the explosion also causes all forms of kryptonite on Earth to transform into harmless iron, which is in turn interpreted by Superman as now he's like, oh, I'm basically invulnerable now. Mm -hmm. So now kryptonite is gone. No longer in... The Superman mythos. We will never see it For again. For like a week. <laughs> we will never see it again. This is permanent. Um, I am so happy. What a relief. Applause by all the comic book <laughs> fans across the world. Kryptonite's gone, everybody. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Now let's talk about Clark Kent's new job. Okay. Clark Kent. He's hired by Morgan Edge to be a television reporter yeah, for is. WGBS. And his first assignment is to cover an experimental mailing rocket that will travel from Metropolis to Los Angeles. When Clark spots some criminals who want the rocket for their own purposes, he goes into action as Superman. However, he begins to notice that his heat vision doesn't work right. It's all weird. As well as... He's not as strong as he used to be. And when he returns to Metropolis, fulfilling his job reporting about the rocket launch, a figure resembling Superman, but Superman made up of sand, emerges from where he had been laid down on the ground following the kryptonite energy machine. Now, remember, I told you about the kryptonite energy machine Mm -hmm. that caused all kryptonite across the world Mm -hmm. to turn iron. From that very spot that Superman hit the ground after the explosion... 
a Superman made of dirt and particulates and sand rose up out of the ground. This, Ashley, is a new character called... Swamp Thing. Nope. Alan Moore. Nope. Sand Superman. Oh, boy. They do love to take Superman's powers away. We love to have alternate Supermans. Now, Ashley, have you heard of this figure? Not never, not once. Well, this is an entity consisting of psychic energy from uh, the world that we all know, Quorum, uh, soil, <laughs> soil from Earth, and power siphoned from Superman. This follows the trend of having a Superman analog, mm -hmm. which we have mm -hmm. lots of. The Superman robots, Bizarro, Composite Superman. Yeah, it's an easy way to have somebody with Superman's proportional strength. But this is also the story element that depowers him. Mm -hmm. This is where his energy drains. So now he's not as he's not punch a planet out of orbit Superman anymore. Because, oh, smart. Because the, the portion of his powers are now in this creature called Sand Superman. Now, Sand Superman will bewitch and hurt Superman for about the next year or so. But we're going to talk a little bit more about him. We're not going to talk about every story with him. But, mm -hmm. but, but I just wanted to set up that he's out there now until I tell you that he's gone. <laughs> okay. Yep. So. Great. Uh, and if anybody wants to send in uh, fan work, fan artwork of Sand Superman, please go ahead. Make us a Sand sculpture. I want an action figure of Sand Superman. I'm just going to tell you that. All so, right, McFarlane, get on it. Then Superman met the Forever People. Ooh. A Jack Kirby creation. Now, Ashley, um, since you were about half close on Inner Gain, let's see if you can get half close on the Forever People. Who, uh, are, who are the Forever People? The Forever People was this like 2012 CW show that I think went for two seasons and had some uh, tie-in digital comics. It's true, actually. Uh, that's just not the ones you're... I don't know. Is that really a CW show? Yes. Wow. And it's not tied to this. Wow, it's so weird. Which is what's crazy. I don't know anything about them. <laughs> the Forever People. People who've lived forever. People from tomorrow. Now, I have to back up a little bit to tell you about the Forever People. Okay. The patriarch of the planet, New Genesis, Isaiah, engaged in a social experiment wherein he selected five random individuals from different points in Earth's history and brought them to New Genesis. These five children were named Beautiful, Dreamer, Moonrider, Big Bear, not the mountain, Seraphin, and Vican. Dreamer, the character that eventually got put on Supergirl? Um, I'm not certain. That's fine. And grew up as close friends and eventually began to refer to themselves as the Forever People. Now, this also might be a good place to explain Jack Kirby's The New Gods, just in case anybody doesn't know. The New Gods are natives of the twin planets of New Genesis and Apocalypse. New Genesis is an idyllic planet filled with unspoiled forests and rivers and beauties and ruled by the benevolent High Father, basically think Zeus with a big old beard and a yeah. staff, while Apocalypse, and that's A-P-O-K-O-L-I-P-S, so Apocalypse, is a nightmarish, polluted, and ruined world with machinery, fire pits, and is ruled by Dark side. Think Thanos, but cooler. Now, the two planets were once part of the same world. They were actually a planet called Urgerd, Urgrund, excuse me, which is German for primeval ground, but it was eventually split apart a millennia ago after the death of the old gods during Ragnarok. These characters are often called the new gods, and they were collectively referred to as Jack Kirby's fourth world. They are great. By the way, beautiful dreamer and dreamer, not the same character. I'm an idiot. Yes. So, Superman while searching out for the forever people to investigate their claims of coming from a super town <laughs> was motivated by a longing to be among people that knew what it was like to be super. Mm. Now, again, you can already hear the Denny O'Neill sort of deeper characters. Like, yes. This is a Superman that is worried about his heart. This is not a Superman that is worried about his bronze and his brains and can I trick Lois Lane into thinking I'm not Clark Kent? Yeah, he's worried about his legacy and his place in the world. Exactly. He's kind of lonely. Mm -hmm. So Superman got more than he bargained for when he learned of the existence of Dark side and Dark Side's ambitions for the anti life equation on Earth. Dark Seed! Now, Superman and this other character named the Infinity Man fought side by side against Dark Side's gravity guards and liberated Beautiful Dreamer, one of the Forever mm -hmm. People, from Dark Side's clutches. Out of gratitude for Superman's help, the Forever People opened a boom tube showing him New Genesis so that Superman could see this super town that they were from mm. for himself. The man is still declined to visit knowing that as long as monsters like Darkseid existed, his first responsibility would be to protect Earth. Oh, what a sweet boy. It's a very nice story, right? Yeah, it is. Then 
we get a super pal team up. Oh, boy. Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen got together, and they decided to confront their new boss, Morgan Edge, about suspicious details of his activities when he was found to have implied ties to intergang. Mm, I remember them. Mm -hmm. And in retaliation against their inquiries, Morgan Edge sent them to investigate a craft from Apocalypse, which had landed in Metropolis Park, kind of the central park of Metropolis. Yeah. Now, Edge had arranged for the craft to trap Clark and Jimmy and send them to Apocalypse to be killed. Now, honestly, I think there are way easier ways to kill Jimmy Olsen. (laughs) Particularly Jimmy Olsen. (laughs) But Morgan Edge has his plans, and only Clark actually fell victim to the snare. Jimmy was able to escape because Jimmy is super cool. Now, Edge sent Bruno Mannheim, the gangster, oh, yeah, who actually yeah. is in charge Fourth of Intergang, World gangster, yeah. to finish off Jimmy. But the Guardian, who is a yellow and blue sort of clone, who is also a member of mm-hmm. Jack Kirby's Fourth World, rescued Jimmy Olsen. In the apocalyptic craft, Clark caught his first glimpse of the first of the Twin Worlds, New Genesis, and Apocalypse. But fortunately, Light Ray, another uh, uh, good new god, intercepted the craft and sent Clark back to Metropolis with a boom tube. But this was not the end of the apocalypse Cold War with Darkseid. And as you can see, if you are a fan of Superman the Animated Series, Mm -hmm. that Bruce Timm got a lot of inspiration from this storyline, from the Bronze Age. Because the Bronze Age is the introduction of the Fourth World, and the Bronze Age is the introduction of Superman's antagonist being dark side mm-hmm. now the man whom the daily planet staff knew as morgan edge was revealed to actually be a program clone of the real morgan edge and he was supposed to put the resources of the galaxy broadcasting corporate empire at the disposal or excuse me and at the whim of dark side quests for the anti-life equation Now, after being created and officially implanted with the copied memories of the real Edge, the clone was commanded by Darkseid to execute the original Morgan Edge. But the clone couldn't go through to it because he had a conscience. Now, the Edge clone instead had a secret soundproof room built into his penthouse suite to contain and to trap the real Morgan Edge that was actually hidden behind a large one-way mirror. And the real Morgan Edge escaped from its one-way mirror, from his captivity, uh, and the clone began executing multiple creative schemes intended to basically capture the real Morgan Edge. As this clone knew that Darkseid would kill him dead if he found out that the real Morgan Edge had escaped. All of these schemes uh, failed because of Superman's interference, and eventually the real Morgan Edge took refuge at a communal farm until he was safe for him to return as being the head in the charge of the GBS. But the death of the evil clone Morgan Edge and his replacement as the owner of the Daily Planet by the real Edge marked a significant hiccup in the unfolding of Darkseid's plans for Earth, as much of the interests of Apocalypse and Metropolis were actually being led by Morgan Edge as Morgan Edge was revealed to be the real leader of Intergang, not Bruno Mannheim. One, it's very funny to think that Morgan Edge went to live on a commune. Mm-hmm. And two, I understand now why you brought up Jack Kirby leaving to go to D.C. Because uh, we're talking an awful lot about Kirby crazy fourth world stuff. We are. We are. We are. I mean, I knew Darkseid was a huge, like, he's in, I would, I would count him among Superman's rogues gallery. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that they tied together so so quickly, most, like right out the gate. Yes, most of the seventies, Darkseid is kind of the real villain of Superman, mm-hmm. and he. I think it's because he was the new big bad, and a literal big bad. Yep. Like he looks badass fighting Superman. Yes, and also I think the interesting and smart things about this is that he's fighting Superman on two levels because not only is Superman fighting the Parademons with his fists, but Clark Kent is having to fight all the machinations of Morgan Edge in real world Metropolis. Yes, exactly. And even within the confines of his job and his day to day life. Mm-hmm. It's very smart. Now, I want to tell you a story about the fourth world? No, about a hundred thousand year old Superman. Okay. Is he living in the sun? Nope. The Time Trapper, a Legion of Superhero villain, covertly induces Superman to use a defective time bubble, a 
time traveling device of the Legion of Superheroes, to journey to the year 101,970 AD. And, <laughs> okay. And places a time barrier behind him, which prevents Superman from flying back or doing any of his time travel mm-hmm. tricks to return to his proper era. Now, Superman ages because of the defunct time bubble. Mm-hmm. And so he becomes 100,000 years old. And although he is still powerful enough to defeat an enemy menace in that era. And he goes further into the future where he sees three superheroes at that time that immunize him to kryptonite, magic, and red suns. Now, Superman, this is a very interesting journey. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because Superman decides to travel even further into the future in which superpowers are outlawed due to a disaster involving three superheroes of the past. Those three superheroes that I talked about. Mm -hmm. And he gets to learn what happens in a world without Superman to the other supporting characters. He learns that Lois Lane marries a very famous actor. He learns that Jimmy writes a book called my years with Superman. Mm. He learns that Perry white creates the Superman museum. And I wanted to ask you, as the big three of Superman supporting cast, do you, do those track with what you know about those characters? The, would those be fitting ends? I think the Perry White one is kind of the most out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think the lowest one's the most out there. But I think they're all correct. Who's the actor? I want it. I uh, he's a fake made up. Yeah, I, I mean, of course, he's a, he's a mm-hmm. fake DC Universe actor. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, you're just like, ooh, I wonder who that would be. Um I could see Lois getting married. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't have an issue with the fact that she gets married. I don't know if she would marry, um, n- which is not to say that um, a, a movie star or an actor is not a person of substance. But I would expect Lois Lane to marry like a real smarty pants, and maybe he is. But yeah. Uh, no, I don't think any of those are super out there. I do like the idea that um, of Jimmy's memoir, and I do believe that Jimmy would write that memoir even after Superman, even if Superman didn't leave at an untimely point in their history i agree now during the storyline superman keeps going further and further into the future he um rescues some astronauts in the year 801,000 ad he goes to the year 1 million and terraforms and repopulates a barren earth he survives the attack of a drone weapon powered by the dead intellect of lex luther and then he is helplessly thrown through the time barrier even further into the future by a comet and superman eventually thinks i'm just going to keep going until the universe ends because i can't go back in the past however when he reaches the end of time and he notices all the universe go to black superman himself can't stay conscious and he blacks out when he wakes up he loosely sees his birth his childhood his boyhood his adulthood, until he returns to the point which when he first took the time trip, after which the timelines diverge, he's dumped back into regular time, and he's free to live out his normal life again. And he figures out that the reason this must happen is because time curves on itself, and he figures that he has received a second chance, and he's never going to give that up again. Dan, they must have been reading a lot of Barry Allen Flash comics when they came up with this. <laughs> it's a very sweet and yet sad yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, It almost sounds like an Elseworlds In a lot of ways. I could see that. But enough of that time travel nonsense. It's time to check in with Crypto the Superdog. Ashley. Hell yeah. Who's that and why do we like him? Uh, Crypto is a uh, yellow lab who apparently lived on Krypton and got- He's not a yellow lab. Yeah, he is. He's a white dog. I mean, if he were a real dog, he'd be a yellow lab. He's a a yellow lab. What's the real Crypto? The one that they're using in Titans. Do you know? A yellow lab. Is he really? Yeah. I see, think he's a mutt, actually, because he's smaller than a lab, but crypto to me always looks like a lab oh, that they just see, haven't colored in. Listeners, this goes to show my knowledge of dogs. I didn't realize that like a white-skinned dog or white-furred dog could still be a yellow lab. Oh, yeah, especially female labs tend okay. to be lighter. Yeah, right. cool. um, so crypto is actually probably a girl. I just learned something. There you go. Uh, crypto, is, uh, crypto is a Kryptonian dog <laughs> of indeterminate species uh, who was sent to Earth to be a companion to baby Superman, and uh, he wears a cape, and he's a super dog. He's the goodest boy. Yes, he is the goodest boy. He's the superest boy. Yeah. Now, after the 1971 revamp of Superman by editor Julius Schwartz, remember? Mm-hmm. Crypto basically made no appearances for several years. No, sweet baby. He's the only... Uh, Crypto and Streaky are the only super pets that I think mm-hmm. we should have. It was explained away in Superman continuity that Crypto was missing. And that Superman couldn't find him. Hence the reason for none of his appearances. You got like lost in a well or something? Until Action Comics number 441, 
the storyline called The Mystery of the Wandering Dog. 441, I'm going to share this cover, whatever it is. Now, at the time, actually, you just have to know that Action Comics had two storylines, and I believe this is the backup storyline. So okay. the cover, I don't think, will well, then, refer to well, this. Well, then I will, find a, I will find a panel from yeah. this to share. Now, in the storyline, Green Arrow and Black Canary mm. try to unveil the mystery of the illusion projector created by Professor Steelgraves. Both are aged by a ray in Steelgraves' hideout, but they are saved when Crypto the Superdog breaks in and destroys the machine, which allows Green Arrow to capture the villain. Sure. When Steelgraves calls Crypto that blasted Superdog, Green Arrow and Black Canary realize that the dog is actually Crypto, mm. who they knew was yeah. missing. But this Crypto is amnesiac. So he doesn't remember that Mm -hmm. he's a super dog. And he actually runs off. And all Green Arrow can do is call up Clark Kent and tell him that, hey, I saw your dog. He's on the loose. Where is he? I don't know. This is pre-cell phones. I don't know where anyone is right now. Damn it, Ollie. (laughs) Uh, But eventually Crypto's- Fat cats, fat cats, fat cats. Eventually Crypto's memory was restored in 1975. Superman number 287. Oh, thank goodness. Asked in a 2006 interview why he liberated Crypto from the limbo kennel. Writer, <laughs> writer Elliot S. Magan said, and I quote, a man needs a dog. A Superman needs a super dog. Because he's the goodest boy. <laughs> I think that's a great quote. <laughs> Elliot S. Magan again, one of the greatest Superman writers of all time. That's very sweet. I like that a lot. Uh, now, Ashley, we're going to talk about something that I think many comic book fans don't know about. Very important event in Superman's life. Because Superman is at the center of the events in the phenomenon known as the miracle of Thirsty Thursday. Whoa. Ashley. Yeah. What do you think Thursday, Thirsty Thursday is? I, I want it to be the Justice League performing in a Magic Mike style show at a local bar wherein you get, you are thirsty, uh, but you can also acquire a cheap drink. But I just know that's not it. It is not. Especially but, in the Bronze Age. Well, let's find out. And listeners, I picked I picked this story because I'd forgotten about this story. And then when I heard the title, and again, Thirsty has many different connotations. It does. Uh, tell your children. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thirsty Thursday is a subject of... Devoted study by Chronicles of the Future, centuries and millennia ahead of us, as one of the truly scientific, inexplicable occurrences in the history of mankind. On Wednesday, August 20th, it was the date of an infamous tenement blaze, and all of the people of Metropolis spontaneously developed a pathological disgust of water. And they fell asleep for a 24-hour period, then awakened on the following day with an incredible thirst upon them. Hence, the nomenclature of Thirsty Thursday. Okay. Now, dozens of time travelers from these distant future time periods came to Metropolis to watch this epic thirsty event. To see it and to divine the true nature of what exactly had happened. Yet, when they came... To these eras, mm. they left not knowing the answer. Mm-hmm. And this is why. Okay. The truth of the so-called miracle of Thursday Thursday was the spell of citywide hydrophobia was caused by Star Lab scientist Dr. Larry Ishmael, who dropped the bile containing a serum being developed clandestinely by Star Labs for exactly that purpose. When he dropped it, trace particles of the volatile vapors spread out and affected everyone in Metropolis. Now, Dr. Ishmael consumed what he mistakenly took to be an antidote, but was in fact a psychoactive drug that temporarily turned Ishmael into a superhumanly strong wild man and sent him on a wild man rampage across Metropolis. Do you think they'll adapt this in the CW Superman and Lois episode? I hope this is Man of Steel 2, and we're not even done yet. (laughs) Uh, Overhearing Star Labs director Dr. Wilson Farr discussing that only 24 hours of constant rest or perpetual physical stimulation could negate the perpetual eff- physical stimulation. Oh boy. Thursday, Thursday, everybody. Yeah, really? You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> because of that, those are the only things that could, in effect, could negate the effects of the hydrophobia serum. Superman placed and detonated tens of sleeping 
gas canisters throughout the municipal sewer system, putting all residents of Metropolis at the same time, including the covert time travelers who came back to watch Mm. this event in a day long sleep spell. What a dream. Only Ishmael was immune to the gas due to his Mm -hmm. crazy wild man psychology and therefore fought Superman for 24 hours straight before his condition could return to normal. Okay, that's kind of cool. When all was said and done, Superman allowed only two other individuals to become privy to the knowledge of what had truly happened on Thursday, Thursday. Oh, can I guess? Well, no, it's it's the two scientists. It's Larry Ishmael and Wilson Farr. Oh, damn. Who are you? I mean... I was going to be like, I don't know, Jimmy and Lois. I was I, no, Honestly, no, no. I was going to make a joke, but... No. Uh, no, Jimmy and Lois were too thirsty on the Thursday. They now, were they were engaging in perpetual physical simulation. Uh, we can only hope. Now, none of the three men revealed the secret to another soul for as long as they lived, which created the legend throughout time as the mystery of Thirsty Thursday. I guess they didn't live that long because them folks could still be alive, and I've never heard of it. And like I said, I think we all know what we're all thinking. I think that's the season finale of season one of Superman and Lois. Hell yeah. Uh, you know what? Also, with the Star Labs, I'm just saying, uh, Mark Guggenheim were very employable. Um, it, it, could, it could tie into Flash super easy. It could. So, there you go. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about WGBS. Oh, I was like, WG Fields? WGBS here, <laughs> reporting the traffic over Metropolis uh, on the um, Swan Bridge. It's pretty packed, but Swan, uh, uh, Superman oh, is uh, flying over a car from the Seagull Pier. <laughs> and, to the uh, Schuster Airport? And it's going to be cleared up pretty soon. All go. right. Um, three of WGBS's... TV newscasters accepted employment at their rivals, the UBC, the United Broadcasting Company. Oh, it was like the University of British Columbia? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And this led Morgan Edge Mm -hmm. to promote Clark to not only he's on the air, but now he's the associate producer of all GBS's news programming. With the objective of fishing for new journalistic talent in the proverbial ocean and ascertaining the fidelity of all WGBS's on-air personalities to the company. So now mm. this is Clark Kent as a producer. He's getting further and further away he's from an associate producer, though. being a he's not writer. not even an EP? Yep. Got to need a title bump. And this is, we're going to talk about a little bit of this, because this, this, new promotion factors into what I think is one of the greatest Superman stories of all time. It happened in Superman issues number 296 to 299. It's a storyline called who took the super out of Superman. Mm. Now Superman in the storyline met his greatest challenge. It was not an external force, but a identity crisis as the last son of Krypton was forced to figure out who is the real self Clark Kent Or Superman. The eternal question. Yes. Now, Clark lost his powers and was knocked unconscious. Again. (laughs) And was knocked unconscious upon collision with a speeding car in the Metropolis streets. When he awoke in the hospital, Clark switched to his hidden Superman costume to leave the building while having to answer any questions about his, you know, not having injuries or whatever. Mm -hmm. Clark returned to his apartment and on the way home, he got attacked by a killer robot that was sent after him by Intergang. Mm-hmm. Now, deducing that he still possessed his powers as Superman, but would suddenly lose them as Clark for some reason, and hypothesizing that the phenomenon might do be due to a cognitive dissonance, excuse me, dissonance from juggling the demands of a double life, Clark decided to spend one full week in his civilian identity without his powers. Now, I know that's a little confusing here. I want to basically say, after this accident, if he's Clark Kent. He doesn't have powers. Mm -hmm. If he's Superman, he he has powers. Okay. So Clark was like, I'm going to live a life as unpowered Clark Kent. So he spent the entire week as Clark Kent. Mm -hmm. So without the need to act as the timid persona of Clark Kent, the defect suspicions as a Superman identity, because Superman would not be seen for the next seven days. Yep. Clark found himself acting more assertive and confident in all of his relationships. And it improved many of his relationships with his GBS coworkers, including Morgan edge and Steve Lombard. And it actually ended up turning on Lois Lane. She likes a confident man. Yep. For his part, Clark fully embraced Lois's advances. He's like, finally. And, for the first time he embraces Jimmy in Superman history, it is openly hinted that Clark Kent and Lois Lane spent several passionate nights together. Woo! We ship it. Inside Clark Kent's apartment, uh, 
Do you know the street address of Clark Kent's first apartment? It's very, it's kind of very famous. You may, you may not 1-800 know it. One eight hundred Good Guy Lane. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, it is three four four Clinton Street. I I didn't know that. Oh no. well, everyone out there, um, if classically this is the address of Clark Kent's apartment. So if you're ever in a trivia game, they ask you what is the apartment of Clark Kent's address or Clark, what's the address of Clark Kent's apartment? I guarantee you this is the answer. Three four four Clinton Street. 1-800-GOOD-GUY LANE. Yeah. What's Dr. Strange's? Something Bleecker Street? 1700? Who knows? It's a, it's 122B, I think. Bleecker Street. Well, 221B is Sherlock's. I think it's 122B. Eh, whatever. This is not the Dr. Doesn't Strange matter. episode. This is not the Dr. Strange episode. Who cares? Um, so, even without his powers, Clark, with the power of his producing, <laughs> resolved. <laughs> Every producer's like nodding their heads with yes. their iPhones right now. <laughs> I know the one thing to stop the gang, <laughs> the powers of the video edit. <laughs> I mean, let's not knock video editors. Yes. Hi, Adam. I was a video editor. That's true. Yes. Uh, so Clark learned the location of the syndicate's rolling office from an underworld stoolie, and he incapacitated the leadership with an anti-gravitor device borrowed from Professor per- Pepperwinkle, which is a Superman character at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Clark Kent was effective at helping to take out inner gang. Now, once the seven days of being Clark Kent had passed, he committed to only being Superman for the next seven days. So, at the time, Superman cleared intergang hoods off the street mm-hmm. with the greater efficiency because he was working 24 hours a day. Because, But because Clark Kent was nowhere to be found, the DA's case against intergang's leader, Max Denver, was missing its star witness. Mm. Lois began to speculate that Intergang had kidnapped Clark Kent. <laughs> and Superman fought and bested an upstart supervillain named Solar Man. But the pressure of serving as a 24 hour seven superhero proved to be too exhausting to endure. And it turned out even a Superman has the same psychological needs as any other man. And a secret identity was needed to anchor the ordinary life that provided him with stability. And at the end of the week, Superman concluded that both parts of him were Clark Kent and Superman, and they represented equally valid and valuable parts. And no one was more the true self than the other. That's very interesting that both of them are valid, because I definitely think that I have an opinion about which is the real man. And I know you do too. Well, we'll get to it in just a second. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about this in a second. Uh, but I want to talk about this little fun storyline because Superman had hardly any time to contemplate the significance of these events because he caught an image of nine of his deadliest enemies. Lex Luthor, Brainiac, Mr. Mixle Spitlick, Terra Man, the Toy Man, the Parasite, Amalok, the Prankster, and the Kryptonite Man, formerly known as the Kryptonite King, when they convened together inside his apartment. What? (laughs) Now, as Superman discovered, the reason for why he seemed to lose his powers when he was Clark Kent was not psychological, but rather all of the suits in his apartment, his Clark Kent suits, had been chemically contaminated. Ooh. And Superman soon pieced together the culprit was his mysterious next door neighbor, Mr. Xavier, who is in actuality an alien agent of destruction sent to demolish the Earth in a 30-year time period by a cutthroat intergalactic transportation company. Someone had read (laughs) The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I'm going to say. I was going to say, is he bald and in a wheelchair? (laughs) Worse still, by luring Superman Superman to his apartment by conjuring the assemblage, it was only an image of the Mm. villains. Xavier had exposed Superman to potent energies that would cause his body to erupt in an explosion and destroy the world once he had defeated the last of the villains. Now, Xavier teamed the villains and spared them off to a faraway location to give himself enough time to leave Earth prior to his own detonation. But luckily for the human race, Superman, because he's Superman, realized what Xavier had <laughs> he realized what Xavier had done. And before it was too late, he managed a way to down the nine villains and to catch Xavier without annihilating the planet. And thus ends the story, who took the super out of Superman? Now, actually, let's talk about this question here. Yeah. Who is the real identity? Is there a real identity? Is the question mute? Clark or Superman? Is this not even a question? Let's talk about this whole, let's talk about this whole rigmarole right here. Ultimately, with all 
with all characters of dual persona, and that's not just superheroes. Superheroes are just the easiest representation of that, right? Um, that can be detectives. That can be like any any character can have multiple personality facets, right? But for superheroes in particular, um, the answer is both, right? Because we are complex human beings, and they are reflections of us. Therefore, they are also complex human beings. Uh, but with Superman, I always came down more on the argument of it's Clark Kent. Like, he is the farm boy from Kansas. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, whereas with Batman, I understand the debate a little bit more. But with Superman, I'm like, no, he's he's Clark. Like Clark is who this man is. So I don't know if you have any different feelings. Uh, it's so funny because I kind of believe the opposite. I believe that Superman is actually who he really is. Mm. And Clark is sort of a persona that he puts on. Um because he's not goofy and he's not timid and he's not silly. Superman is who he is. Superman is the Clark that came from Smallville. He is timid though, because like look at his, how he treats like Lois. Uh, yes and no. Uh, but I, they are both Clark Kent. That mm -hmm. is 100% true. But I do feel that Clark Kent is the exaggerated him. Okay, I, that's fine. Because if you notice for me, it's like every time, um, now I'll tell you this. I think he likes being Clark Kent more mm -hmm. than Superman. I really do. I think he likes being Clark Kent more because the things that Clark enjoys mm -hmm. are the normal human things. He likes going to the baseball game with Lois. Yeah. He likes going to the diner. He likes going to see and a Taking play. John to the fair. He yeah. likes to write. He mm -hmm. likes to do things like that. Whereas like he's happy to help people. But I, I think when he's Superman, every once in a while, you're going to catch a thing where like when it's the seventh emergency of the day, he's a little bit like, <sighs> Like, I definitely think he's, I just want a he's more Lois. burdened by being Superman. I agree. Like, I don't think Diana is burdened by being Wonder Woman. I just think Diana's probably the most melded. Mm -hmm. um, and I I think Batman is just, I think he's Batman. Yeah, Batman is Batman all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so let's travel, Ashley, to the far off world of... The 1980s? 2001. Jason, you just explained these ages to us at the beginning. That's not in this lesson. I'm going to get on Twitter. Well, in Superman number 300, it was a storyline, a fun little imaginary story. It's basically if, what if Superman existed in the far off world of 2001? 30 years in the future? Yes. That's like when people set stuff in like. But also. 2025 for us 20 years in the past uh yes i meant from like publication actually have you ever imagined what our lives could be like in the world of 2001 that far off age uh not really because i was a child <laughs> and i wasn't thinking too much about it but i lived it so now, yes for everybody listening i just want to say that this comic was published in 1976 so go with it yeah so uh, it actually opens with the phrase it's a bird it's a stratojet it's superman i mean i wish <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's wipe out them Boeing Boeing seven thirty sevens and get some strato jets going. So the storyline is basically: what if Superman landed in nineteen seventy six instead of the thirties? And here's all the changes. Oh, that's cool. So his baby rocket falls into the ocean. It's a fight between the USA and the USSR. The USA grabs it. Uh, they raise the super baby in a U.S. military facility, uh, but they still make him a Superman suit, and they convince him to fight for America, and they name him Skyboy, hence the S on his chest. Good Lord. Yes. When his existence is announced to the world, he becomes a ward of the United Nations, and it basically creates a war where he has to toss all the nukes into space, a la the last Superman movie of Christopher Reeve, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Is that the one where he gets drunk and fights people in a bar? That's Superman 3. <laughs> okay. Now cut to the far off year of 2001 mm -hmm. where people have floating chairs and it's not television. It's called Tri-Vision. And Clark Kent is a Tri-Vision reporter. It's called television. Yep. Uh, he's named Clark Kent in this version because he's named for the military people that helped him. One of the guys is like Lieutenant Kent. It is, uh, does he watch Who's Line? Which was very big at the time. Not in this universe. Bummer. Drew Carey doesn't survive the apocalyptic war of the 1980s. <laughs> That's a joke only for me. Now, eventually an alien appears and he redresses himself as Superman for reasons. And, <laughs> and he helps the world. <laughs> Great. I mean, look, it's not... Honestly, it's no worse an origin than any other comic. Well, I hope you all enjoyed the uh, fun diversion to the far off world of 2001. <laughs> what a far off place.
I hope our world becomes like that one day. I love it when we can't explain things, so we just go reasons, <laughs> comics. They literally, patriarchy. they li- li- the scene is basically like he's like, I am Sky Boy no more. Call me Superman, and you're like, where? Why? It is a better you, name. You never. That name has never come up in this story. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Had you uh, read that issue before doing this lesson? No. no. Okay. Interesting. No, I, I I found it on I found it in my research, and I yeah, was like, yeah, "Oh, yeah. this is gonna be a fun one." Great. So, anyways, so soon back to the non-imaginary world of two thousand and one. Uh, <laughs> back to the revolving present of Superman. Yeah, Superman soon discovered that all of Krypton's uh, excuse me, all of Earth's Kryptons. Kryptonite, <laughs> all of Krypton's Earth night. <laughs> I don't know why I switched that. All of Krypt. Uh, all of this, <laughs> damn it, I'm still doing All it. All the kryptonite. Ah, I think I deserve one of these now. <laughs> <laughs> what would Krypton's Earthenite look like? What color would it be? Just be a clot of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Just be brown. Okay, so if it's so if kryptonite is green, mm-hmm. right? The most common kryptonite is green. Across the color wheel, so if we're going by color theory, the complementary or the oppositional Wouldn't color. Earth be blue? Is red, mm. so it should be a, a ruby, I guess, or like a red jasper. But it, you'd call it Earth Knight or, or Earth Knight or Terranite, maybe. Ter- maybe Terranite, Krypton the Terranite. All right. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> uh, basically, Superman found out that all the world's Kryptonite had not been turned inert. No Why? kidding. Plot reasons. Reasons. Yep. Comics. Basically. Bronze Age. And back at the Galaxy Building, Morgan Edge, Clark Kent's boss, revealed the identity so, of. So back at the Galaxy's Edge. I'm not going to dignify that with a response. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me another sad trombone. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, and back at the Galaxy Building, Morgan Edge unveiled the identity of Clark Kent's new co-anchor, Lana Lang. Hell yeah! Ashley, who is Lana Lang? Uh, Lana Lang is Superman's childhood best friend slash first girlfriend in my head canon. He is, she is his first girlfriend. Um, his first many things, and uh, she does briefly become a reporter during this. I remember this from the Lana Lang episode. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, she's a babe. I love Lana. I love Lana as well. And to end the Bronze Age of Superman, we need to talk about the last Bronze Age adventure with Batman in World's Finest number 323, which has a cover date of January 1986. But if you know cover dates, they're always three months ahead, so mm-hmm. technically it takes place in 1985. I know, I know, but it still counts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Basically, this is a wacko story, by the way. World's Finest is a trip, man. Superman is attacked in space by a villain called Nightwolf sure. that looks like he belongs on an episode of Yellowstone. <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, maybe Ashley should share a picture of Nightwolf. Sure. That might be a funny thing. Peacock, you want to sponsor yep. us? Anytime. Nightwolf threatens to kill Superman, and Nightwolf's mentor arrives out of <laughs> nowhere, and he's like a Native American shaman. Sure. And this shaman... Beats Nightwolf off up only to reveal that it's secretly Batman in disguise. When Superman wakes up from all this, Batman chides Superman, saying that I won't always be there to save you, and you need to leave the night to experts. Oh, for God's sake. And he leaves, and their bond of friendship ends as the two of them officially head into Crisis on Infinite Earths. That's... Kind of a bummer. I... <laughs> I was going to say that's terrible, but I don't want to disrespect the people who worked on that issue. Well, when we get to Batman, or excuse me, Superman, the Dark Age, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of the early Dark Age storylines, especially the 90s storylines, they it took a long time to get around. It took till the year 2000 mm-hmm. for Batman and Superman to be best friends again. Yeah, that's true. Because they were that Batman Superman series. Because it was the Batman Superman which series, which is great. Which is great. Series. But we a, talked about a lot on the Supergirl. But a so. lot of it, it, a lot of the 90s, as you will learn, is a like is Batman being super like, dick Batman. Is Batman like I'm not friends with you? Yeah. We work together. Yeah. That's but, a bummer. Though. <laughs> it is a bummer. But that's not how I'm going to end the Bronze Age. Because I can't end the Bronze Age without telling you about the story of when Superman met the champ Muhammad Ali. I was wondering if we were going to get to this. And you talked about the man that he fought all night. Oh, uh, this is The an, champ is here. The champ is here. An all-time iconic cover. Yep. Um, you want to invest in comics? This is a good one to invest in. It is a good one to get. No, I'm not going to. I'm, I am going to tell you everything in the storyline, 
but not every single thing. I am mm-hmm. going to paraphrase some things, but enough. We're going to talk about this for a bit because actually I don't think you've ever read it. Have you? I have not. No. Okay. So by the late 1970s, Superman had been paired in the comic pages with real life American icons like John F. Kennedy, Steve Allen, Bob Hope, Jerry Lewis, Alan Funt, Don Rickles, and Pat Boone. Ashley, please explain who every one of those are. No, no, no. Please don't. Uh, American icons. Yeah. Oh, well done. Thank you. Well done. Now. I was like, I own, I know most of those people. Superman meets Muhammad Ali suffered numerous delays. It was originally going to be published in fall of 1977, but it didn't get published until spring of 1978. Mm. And by the time the book Sounds was like published, Muhammad Ali was no longer the heavyweight world champion. Well, he's still an icon. Yep. But here's the fun fact. He had been dethroned. He'd been dethroned by Leon Spar- Spinks, excuse me, in February of 1978. And in that year of 1978, in September, uh, Ali, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay mm-hmm. would reclaim the title. So well, he lost it go. and then reclaimed it again. Here's the story. It is bonkers, yet kind of fun. I also believe there have been several statues slash action, action figure combos of this cover. Uh, there is, here we go, action figure spotlight. I need, I need the theme song for action sp- figure spotlight. Here we go, action figure spotlight. There is some amazing, I believe they're made by NECA action figures of Superman and Muhammad Ali like the cover and they are shell, they are cell shaded like I know exactly what you cover. mean yeah they are fantastic uh we'll share some of that on our Twitter over mm-hmm. at GHL podcast but let's talk about the book yes an, let's. an alien visitor named Ratlar is the <laughs> maniacal leader of a species of aliens called the scrub <laughs> under the claim that earthlings are dishonorable and they're aggressive and they pose a potential threat to his people, the scrub, he demands that Earth's greatest champion fight the greatest scrub fighter, the behemoth known as, now it's spelled H-U-N apostrophe Y, which I'm going to call Honey. Yeah. So Superman and Muhammad Ali both come forward to volunteer for this battle. However, Ollie argues that Superman is not really of Earth and actually has an unfair advantage in many of his superpowers. And in typical Ali-style verbiage, <laughs> Superman, <laughs> come for the champ! <laughs> uh, I can't do as many of the rhymes as Muhammad Ali, and I would it would be a shame for me to even try. But... That if you don't know what I'm doing with the 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 bongos, then, then you should do some googling because Muhammad Ali is an incredible figure. I will it, try to find a video of it. Is of a that. very famous uh, Muhammad Ali was very well known for his trash talk of his fighters, and he was quite poetic in a lot of it. And he would usually do a bit of it like by by slamming down on tables or slamming down. I mean, on yeah, the it's room. basically like poetry. Yes, beat poetry. So, uh, in this book, he basically takes Superman down a peg and and says that he should be the champion for Earth. Intrigued by Muhammad Ali's poetic trash talk, (laughs) Ratlar decides that, you know what? Superman and Ali should fight one another to determine who should be Earth champion. And to make the fight fair, he decrees that the match should take place on his home planet, Bodachi, which orbits a red star. Now, why is that important to Superman? Superman gets his powers from our yellow sun slash star, a red sun, which I believe is what Krypton had, uh, doesn't give him the same amount of power. So he's basically as powerful as a human. Correct. So this would make the winner simply the best boxer. Mm-hmm. The two would-be champions decide that Ali will train Superman in the finer points of boxing because obviously Superman doesn't know boxing to make it as fair as well. Yes, which becomes a plot point much later when Superman doesn't know martial arts. Either. Exactly. And also it makes it very fair and also goes to prove why Muhammad Ali was a true champion mm-hmm. because he decided, you know what, I'm going to make this even more fair for Superman because who doesn't know boxing? Yeah. I mean, and if he's the greatest, he'll defeat him no matter how much training he has. Exactly. Absolutely. And that's what Muhammad Ali he wants fair fight. Yep. Now. Eventually, the Superman versus Muhammad Ali match is broadcast on intergalactic television to thousands of other worlds with Jimmy Olsen, Superman's pal, acting as the broadcaster, which I love. Aw, Jimmy. And the match is underway, and it soon becomes apparent that Ali is going to kick Superman's ass. Well, he flits like a butterfly and sings like a bee. Superman takes a serious pummeling, and Ali is crowned Earth champion, set to face the big fighter, Honey. Now... (laughs) Look, I've never heard this word said out loud. No, I'm no, no. Honey. I've, I've never. It's just funny. Um, it's just funny. It might be Hanya. There's an A in it, but I'm just going to call him Honey. It's fun. Once the match begins, however, Ali quickly starts to suffer from fighting the super-powered Honey. 
Mm. Meanwhile, during this fight, Superman has recouped. He has a recovery, and he actually steals a scrub command ship and sabotages their space armada because he learns that the scrub are just going to invade Earth anyway. How Mir- like an alien. Miraculously, Ali gets a second wind, and in... Now, if you don't know anything about Muhammad Ali, you should know this. Muhammad Ali would sometimes predict what round he mm-hmm. would take down his opponents. Now, when fighting Hunya, or Honey as I like to call him, Ali in the book said, I'm going to take him down in the fourth round. And in the fourth round, Muhammad Ali gets a punch, knocks Honey out of the ring, and Woo! knocks him out, winning the fight. But after witnessing Superman's decimations of their space armada, the scrub leader cries foul. And this is, excuse me, this is, I got a little bit ahead of myself. This is when he uh, de- decrees that I'm going to blow up Earth. Mm. Just as Ratlier is about to give the go ahead to his backup forces, his own champion, Honey, becomes enraged at Ratlar's tragedy and deposes the leader stopping the annihilation attack because he was like, why would we attack someone who is honorable, mm-hmm. a planet that's honorable because of Muhammad Ali and Superman. Superman is rescued. Honey, the new scrub leader makes peace with Ali, Superman and earth. And the very end of the book shows Ali and Superman in a private moment. And Ali reveals that he has figured out Superman's secret identity as Clark Kent and vows to keep it secret. And the book ends with the two champions embracing and Ali proclaiming, Superman, we are the greatest. And that, That's my friends. kind of awesome. It's a great book. Yeah. It's a little goofy. Better than I expected, but it, though. But it's a great, if you know anything about Muhammad Ali, it's actually like a sweet and well done book. Nice. Very uh, nice. And Muhammad Ali is a champion. Go Google him. He is a, a historical figure that is well worth doing some research on. Absolutely. And my friend, we end the Bronze Age with Superman being declared the champion. Because that's a better ending than him going boo-hoo-hoo with Batman. And that is the end of Superman, the Bronze Age. Good job. And now we move into... Where, if you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading, we have these cool little Amazon widgets that go all the way back to the very first zero episode. And we recommend stuff that you can read if you want to learn more about Superman in the Bronze Age specifically. Steal a little bit of money from Jeff Bezos' pocket to put it in ours so we can keep having celebrity boxing matches at the Mind University. Yes, that is correct. The very first one that is going on there is the book I just talked about, Superman versus Muhammad Ali, the deluxe edition. They made a hardcover version of this book about Three or four years ago, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's amazing. The quote unquote single issues, which has very rarely been out of print. There's what? always yeah. a collection mm-hmm. or a treasury edition of it that you can find. Yes. Because it's iconic. Yes. And secret of the cover, uh, many of the DC employees and famous celebrities mm-hmm. that existed in the time are on the crowd on the cover. Um, if you've never read it, I highly recommend it. I mean, there's no there's no bigger Superman Bronze Age book than Superman versus Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Very My second choice is Superman in the 70s. It is an out-of-print book, but you can find it used. And it's a lot of stories of the 70s, because the 70s took place in most of the uh, dark, uh, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Bronze. The Bronze Age. I believe, I could not confirm, I believe that the storyline that we talked about that we really loved, who took the super Mm -hmm. out of Superman, Superman is in that trade. And it's like the only place it's ever been published. Of course it is. Uh, My last choice is Action Comics, 80 Years of Superman, the Deluxe Edition. Now, this has many different periods of Superman, but I have this hardcover. It's great. And it has some really good Bronze Age issues in it. And you used it a lot as a jumping off point for your research for this episode. I used it for research in this thing. I don't think I talked about any of the specific issues in it. That's okay. But um, I, I read it as some research. So, let's go into the discussion. Yes, what are we uh, going to discuss? Well, we're going to talk about some things. I thought you were going to explain what the discussion is. But oh, it's where good. we discuss more things. I know, I just, yeah, it's very simple, you know. Uh, anyways, <laughs> Ashley. Yeah. For you, mm-hmm. just found out about the Bronze Age. How familiar, let's get this out of the way real quick. How familiar with Superman in the Bronze Age were you before this lesson? Uh, almost not at all. Okay. You've. I was aware of some of the broader. I knew he became a TV news anchor. Mm-hmm. I knew he did Fourth World stuff, and I I know about the Muhammad Ali issue. Yes. Okay. So you've now heard Superman the Gold Age, mm-hmm. Superman the Silver Age, and Superman the Bronze Age. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say is the main differences between Superman the character in the Silver Age and Superman the character in the Bronze Age for you? Interesting. Um, the Bronze Age, because I would say. 
I know we're going by this dark age and modern age thing. It's only, you know, and I will I will caveat, th- here's my caveat. I will only caveat this here because I went with dark, I don't like the term dark age. I don't either. I went with it because I do 100% think that. Totally, I think it's accurate. Calling the modern age from 1985 to now is ridiculous. Is too long, but I feel like the sensibility that we have in comics right now starts with. I would, to be honest. Crisis with, on Infinite Earth. I would almost call it the speculator age. Yeah, or but, maybe the indie age, but but I went with dark age because many different uh, comic journalism sites, yes, many yeah, yeah, different yeah, yeah. forms, many yeah. if there can be such a thing a comic historian, we're just not all fa- they all agree on the dark age. We're not far enough away from it to have an official name yet. But Agreed. what is what is interesting to me about the Bronze Age in particular is that um, you see all of these characters um, m- they're maturing. Yep, and I don't mean that they are literally getting older, but because Superman's been like thirty five forever. Um, I don't know how old Superman is. I for me, he's c- consistently thirty five. I think that's what you said in your timeline, right? I actually think I, I in my timeline I made him forty eight because John Kent ruins that. Well, John does <laughs> if John is ten. I yes. like the idea that that Superman is is always in his, like his mid thirties, mid to late forty thirties. Excuse me. Yeah, he's, he's a, somewhere between thirty five. He's a little and younger than Batman because I like that. I like that. I like that Superman's been around for a while because I like the idea that younger heroes look up to him. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing about is they, is they mature, and this is where you see, even though the Comics Code Authority is still around, um, you do see boundaries in the types of stories that can be superhero stories starting to get pushed here. And that's what I think is very interesting about the Bronze Age is I would have said um, before maybe the last couple of years that, that, that the Dark Age is where we really see like a rejection of the Gold and Silver Age, but I think it starts with these comics in the seventies leading into the eighties, because, but with Superman in particular, I think it's, we are shaking off the traditional trappings of Superman and we're trying on different things. We put him against this cosmic, um, these cosmic gods in space. We, we moved him up to television. We made him a producer. We let him and Lois have a relationship. Like we are seeing Superman do things that maybe weren't traditionally thought of as Superman. Yes. What stands out for you? Uh, he's more man than Superman. Mm-hmm. It's the first time that it's the first he's human. It's the first period of Superman comics that focuses on Clark Kent and the man and the emotion inside than just the guy who can punch planets and is trying to be. There is a term called super dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where in, and that refers to Superman constantly tricking Lois Lane. I think this this is this is the period that marks the transition the death of Super Dick to the Superman that we know. Mm-hmm. The Silver Age yes. Superman, the silly goofy Superman dies in this period. Yes. Uh yeah, this Superman feels almost modern, almost yep. like the Superman that we would see now. And that's interesting and it is interesting through the lens of history, right? Like Jason and I were obviously not alive for this, so we have nothing but hindsight where this is concerned, but it's interesting to like look at it through the lens of modern day and be like this is where it starts. Yep. Cool. Sweet. All right, let's go to the teaching tweet. Ooh, you did a teaching tweet? I, I, I've accepted I've accepted it, and I'm just moving on. Oh, Professor Jason's favorite part of the podcast, where oh, in 240 characters or less, he is going to, actually 180 or whatever, because we go by the original rules. Uh, he's going to sum up. This is why I don't like this section. Everything you just learned about uh, Bronze Age Superman, which you can find this posted on our Twitter at GHL Podcast. Bronze Age Superman, a man of action and emotion, a hero that finally proved that Clark Kent is just a much, as much a hero as Superman. That's it. Nice. Because that's what this period means to me. And now we're going to the honor roll. Yes. What's the honor roll? I'm asking you. The honor roll is where if you go to Apple Podcasts and you leave us a five-star review, we'll read whatever you write. And let me tell you, friends, this week we have somebody who took that to heart. Oh, boy. Uh, So gird yourself. Okay. Uh, If you are an international listener, we also really recommend that you do this. Uh, The only problem is we can't see it. So please leave your reviews. Take a screenshot and send them to us at geekhistorylesson at gmail.com. And we'll read them on the air. That is correct. So we have two people joining the honor roll today. And uh, we'll do the good news before the bad news. Oh, boy. First person to join us is Smith1701, who says, Good people I'd like to hang out with. They are a great team, very pleasant to listen to. I always look forward to listening to what you're doing next. Thank you, Smith1701. Thank you. 
They are also very, very kind. Also joined by GZ underscore eighty eight, who says, "Great show." Jason Inman always makes a joke of Ashley's episode, always interrupting and making jokes. I guess. But they gave us five stars, and we said if you gave us five stars, we'd read whatever you wrote. So thank you for bumping us in the algorithm. This is all you get. I will also say, Jason and I are not perfect human beings. We thank everyone who listens. Hey, I, And we I, welcome your honest opinion. What's his name? Jeezy underscore 88. Hey, Jeezy. Thanks for... Thanks for the five stars. Thanks for, five, thanks for five listening. Stars. Um, I'm surprised there's 85 people that wanted that name. Yeah, there's 87 people who wanted that name. Oh boy, um, I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't get the interrupting thing. I don't either. I don't understand it. Do I, I, don't I? Know. This is just the way we, we just talk. we just talk. It's just the way we talk. We talk like this. Also, thank you, but I don't need to be protected from Jason. What? I don't. Wait, stop! I gotta interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for those five Thank stars. Thank you so much. Uh, a little bit of real talk. Welcome to real talk. Also, look, if you're going to rib us, we're going to rib back. Hey, it's, it's just fine. playful. It's all good. Yeah, whatever. Uh, thank you so much for uh, leaving us five stars. Welcome both of you into uh, the, teacher's the Teacher's Lounge, lounge of the Mine University. Um, over in the corner, there is a display set up. Made of popsicle sticks. Somebody made a popsicle stick display of the Superman versus Muhammad Ali fight. And weirdly, weirdly, it was Professor Magan, Elliot S. Magan. And this is why this is weird. Because Professor Magan teaches dental hygiene. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know why popsicle sticks. Don't get it. But uh, you can view it. Maybe they're tongue depressors for Welcome. holding your tongue down. Don't touch my apple in the fridge. Uh, so... Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast everywhere you can listen on Spotify, SoundCloud, and all those places. Click follow, click download. Mm -hmm. That way you don't miss every episode. And uh, hey, do us a favor. If you like this episode or you know a Superman fan in your life, email them this episode and say, hey, you should check out this podcast. If you know a Superman fan that is not listening to our show, I guarantee you they'll love the Bronze Age. And, you know, you help out the Mind University. And we will thank you for it. So um, don't also, if you want to suggest Future lessons like Superman the Dark Age. If you want us to get to Superman the Dark Age as fast in less as than a hundred episodes, you can go do that where Ashley. The best place to do that is geekhistorylesson.com, Facebook.com slash geek history lesson, or on Twitter at GHL Podcast, because Geek History Lesson was too many letters. That's right. And don't forget to follow us. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Jawin. That's J A W I I N. You can follow Ashley on Instagram and Twitter at Ashley V Robinson. And also, don't forget to check out our Patreon over at patreon.com slash Jawin. Uh, this week's episode of GHL Extra that you can only hear on the Patreon and for your support is uh, we're going to be talking about high selling and popular Bronze Age comics. It'll be interesting to see what other comic books were popping mm -hmm. at the time of Bronze Age Superman. What his competition was, yo. Yeah. All right, now we're to hashtag stick around. The final section of the podcast where we see if you stuck through the plugs. Ashley. Yeah. Do you like the idea of Clark Kent as a television anchor? I don't dislike it. I don't think Clark Kent is the kind of person who would really want to be on camera, though. I agree. Um, I actually... Hold on, I gotta interrupt you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> proceed, proceed. That's very funny. That will never not be funny. I know. <laughs> uh, um, I actually really like the modern conceit that he is a blogger or that he he works in a more digital sphere. Yeah, they did that in the New 52. Yeah. Yes, Uh I understand we want to keep him working with the Daily Planet, um, but I think that that's an interesting evolution. But I appreciate that we did have him as an anchor and as a producer and that we let him do something different. Well, and that, I think it was very innovative for the time. That would have been the height of broadcast news. Who would have been the hot news anchors in the 70s or 80s? Um, I think Cronkite would have still been around. Iconique. Let, uh, let me see what else. You don't have to... Google it. You don't want to. I only know Canadian. Reporters. I'm actually very curious about who, in terms of Americans, who that would be. Uh, biggest TV brought news people. What would you say? News, news anchors. News anchors of the 1970s. It's an exciting of the, podcast. Of the Bronze Age of comics. Of the Bronze Age. <laughs> Google's like, what the hell does that mean? Um, 
Mm. I, 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 it's hard. There's, that's fine. That's there's fine. no answer here. This is not. You were not alive in the 70s, so it's not fair of me to ask, to be fair. I mean, Walter Cronkite is on there. Great. What's the heat? Um, heat. Heat. Peter Jennings is on there. Oh, sure. Henry Reasoner is on there. I don't know who Henry Reasoner is. It's a great name. Ted Koppel. Yep. Is on there. Uh, Hugh Downs, who is a very big, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, now that I remember that. Uh, Leslie Stahl. I don't know. Cool. A bunch, bunch of people. Wow. I learned something. Yeah. There you go. I think it's Cronkite. Uh, I agree. Uh, him being a broadcaster is a bad idea for a guy with a secret, secret identity. identity. Yeah. yeah. I kind of like the idea of him being a news producer. That makes sense because mm -hmm. it's something that he would be able to do, but it would allow him to work in television. You know, I I kind of felt I kind of felt like Lois would be the more appropriate yes. one to be yes. the online uh, broadcaster. But um, I'd also like to mention this, and Jason didn't ask me to do this, but in uh -oh. Uh, uh -oh. you know in, in your in your book Super Best Friend, you also sort of taken uh, an exploration of what a Superman type character's relationship to the media is like. That is correct. That's what that whole book is. That yeah. that the whole crux of that story is the public perception mm -hmm. of superheroes and the public perception of superhero fandom. Yeah. It's a big, it's, and I think a lot of people won't realize that when you get, cause it, the intention is to get six issues. Mm -hmm. And I think when I get to the end and if you're in the far future, you've already read the end. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, when I'm recording this, I'm, I haven't written issue mm -hmm. six yet, but I think people will see that it is sort of like, yeah, it is my take on modern superhero fandom and the, the good and the bad parts of that. Yeah, so there you go. There's a little super best friend uh, added Easter egg. Well, my my Superman character in that, uh, Captain Terrific, mm -hmm. is a he is a book editor. He's a book publisher. Yes, he is. So he works in publishing, but he's more, and he doesn't want to write. He wants to edit. Like, that's his idea. He's mm -hmm. not the writer. He's not the creative. He is the. He's the adjuster. Almost. He's the adjuster. Yeah. yeah, that's what he wants. He's to the do. finesser of stories. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yeah, I just that thought just occurred to me as we were talking about. Superman. Well, thanks for the plug. You're welcome. Yes. All right, Ashley. Why don't you uh, close up the podcast for us? Okay. Uh, you already said the social media handles, so I say I'm Ashley Victoria Robinson. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. There you go. You got to thank the listeners. You say I'm Jason Inman. And then I say, well, you don't have to do all of it. Jason, <laughs> would you please dismiss the class? Oh, I didn't. I didn't intend for you to take all of it on here. <laughs> Fine, okay, keep, I'm just gonna. Uh, no, you could just. And then, and then you say, uh, "I'm Jason." Insert whatever Bronze Age joke you made at the beginning, in men. And uh, class is now dismissed. You filthy animals! Watch out for Sand Superman. Oh yeah. <laughs>